Annie Leahy, the Executive Director of Mechanics Hall, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the 2019 Sparrow Lecture. <clears throat> I want to begin with enormous gratitude for those who have made this evening possible, and that starts with Robert Baird. Robert brought the idea of this lecture to us, and he has been beyond generous with his time and his resources to make the program and our Capital Craft photo exhibit, which if you haven't seen, please visit in the classroom on your way out, come together. The artistry and craftsmen that went into the design and the restoration of the U.S. Capitol Dome are at the heart of Mechanics Hall. Our founders, the Maine Charitable Mechanics Association, were mechanical artists, carpenters, painters, woodworkers, engineers, blacksmiths, and architects. Tonight, we celebrate that history in this beautiful historic ballroom. So thank you, Robert. I want to thank our sponsors for this evening, Turner Construction, the United Association of Plumbers and Pipefitters, Local 7116, and the New England Mechanical Contractors Association, Oak Point Associates, and Chimbro. Thank you also to our many mechanic and maker patrons that I see in the audience tonight. And of course, our staff and our volunteers and our Sparrow Lecture Committee. Chair Pam Plum, our board president Paul Stevens, Dale Doucette, Carolyn, Greg, Chandra, and Kathleen. Could I get a show of hands of people that this is your very first visit to Mechanics Hall? Oh my goodness. Wow. Well, welcome especially to all of you. And I hope that tonight's event is just the beginning of our relationship with you. Mechanics Hall has been at the center of Portland's art district for 160 years. It has served a community of people who are curious about history, creativity, ingenuity, and knowledge. This building and this ballroom have been home to great debates conversations, performances, and lectures. And we are excited to continue that tradition with the Sparrow Lecture this evening. I know that before I began working on this program, I didn't necessarily think of construction workers and tradespeople as artists. But as you will see tonight, they very much are. And when you think about what the capital represents, the ideals that guide us as a country, that dome is a masterpiece. It is an architectural and artistic expression of our democracy. And I cannot think of anyone who shares that sentiment more than our very special guest this evening, Senator Angus King. If you follow the senator on Instagram, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. He has captured the Capitol Dome in photographs from every imaginable angle, in every light and season, and through his eyes, you truly experience the beauty and majesty of this architectural gem. Senator Angus King was sworn in as Maine's first independent United States Senator in January of 2013, filling the same seat that once held by storied Maine leaders Edmund Muskie, George Mitchell, and Olympia Snow. He serves on four oversight committees, rules, intelligence, armed services, and energy and natural resources. And of course, Senator King also served as the 72nd governor of our great state of Maine. During his two terms in the Blaine House, he achieved significant reforms in education, mental health service, land conservation, environmental protection, and the delivery of state services. He was re-elected in 1998 by one of the largest margins in Maine's history. Senator, while our day jobs differ dramatically, we both share a sense of awe for the history and beauty of the buildings in which we work. We are so grateful to have you here this evening to share your knowledge and appreciation of this historic landmark, and we are delighted to provide you with a small respite to talk about the building you so admire, so admire rather than what might be going on inside of it. <laughs> Will you please join me in welcoming Senator Angus King? Uh, 
Before I begin, I'd like to give you a, a, a short uh, presentation on what we're accomplishing these days in the U.S. Senate. Okay. Uh, I, th th I'm, I'm hesitant about this presentation for a number of reasons, not the least of which is Earl Shuttleworth is here. Earl Shuttleworth, uh, the state historian, started first with Governor uh, Joshua Chamberlain. Uh, <laughs> uh, worked with Earl for many years, and I think Earl will remember this meeting. When they decided to renovate the, the State House in Augusta, of course, the governor's office is in the State House. There, Earl came in, do you remember, remember? And there was a group of builders, and they came in and sat down with me and said, you know, we're going to renovate your office. And I said, no. And the reason I did was I didn't want a headline that said, you know, a million dollars spent on new drapes for the governor's office or something. And, at first, and then I compromised and said, OK, you can put in new carpet. And then I said, well, maybe, and they actually, it was you and Kay finally leaned on me, and they, they renovated the governor's office, and lo and behold, there was a drop ceiling that had been there since nobody knew how long. They pulled it down, and there was this beautiful cornice all the way around that was, you know, had been covered up for probably 50 or 75 years, and it turned into an absolutely beautiful space. So, Earl, thank you for persuading me uh, to do that. Um, I cannot take, stop taking pictures of the United States Capitol. Uh, it is just so inspiring, and uh, one of my favorite things to do is either to escort visitors into the rotunda or to be standing there when people who haven't been there walk in. And universally, it, there's this, I mean, the word awe is overused, but that's what comes across people's faces. It's, it's, it is truly, I believe, one of the great interior spaces in the world. I took this one day sitting on this bench, and the, word down, the world down there is so chaotic and hectic that every now and then, if you can just catch a quiet moment, I sat on the bench and, isn't that an amazing place to go to work? That's, your, that's my office. Now, I'm going to get this out of the way first, and I've, you've seen this on a number of my Instagrams, and you don't have to follow me on Instagram, Angus King, Maine. <laughs> but it would be nice. It took me six months to persuade my staff to let me do it by myself. <laughs> so if you want an unfiltered view of what I'm thinking and doing, this is the place to go. So uh, it was just it, the, what I have said several times on these uh, pictures is, it's too bad our work doesn't match the magnificence of the surroundings. It is one of the most magnificent places. The people who uh, built uh, and, and uh, created this incredible space uh, had a great vision of America. And one of the great stories about the Capitol is that it was built in the early part of the, of the 1800s and they came to a, a sort of a pause in the, in the 1850s and started the dome in 1855, I think, and then it was stopped. The work was stopped, and Congress wanted to stop the work for the Civil War. They, you know, they were, you know, the, they were otherwise occupied, and Lincoln wouldn't let them. Lincoln said, no, we're going to finish this because it's a symbol of the Union and of the, of the grandeur of this great country. So the dome was finished. Uh, after the Civil War, I think about 1866 uh, or 67, but it is one of the great interior spaces. Now, one of the things that people always look at when they come in, and Robert's, uh, Robert's going to do this in more detail, but at the top is a, is a painting, and most people look up and think they're, it's a painting of God. There's this guy on a throne and, and uh, sort of angels around, but it's not. It's George Washington. And the angels are hold the, the women are holding a banner that says, E pluribus unum, out of many one, from many one, which by the way has 13 letters, 13 colonies, 13 letters, E pluribus unum. Now, one of the really interesting things, and I learned this, Mary and I redid our house in Brunswick uh, about 20 years ago. And we wanted a room with a, with a cathedral ceiling. And there was a, 
a, a, a room, you know, with a peaked roof. And our architect, a guy named Tony Jackson, some of you may know him, a wonderful architect. By the way, my favorite course in college was architecture. I wanted to be an architect, but I was awful in math, and I was afraid the buildings would fall down. <laughs> so I failed in that uh, aspiration. But when Tony did our room, he pointed out that the interior ceiling is different than the actual roof. It's a shallower pitch. And then he whipped out a picture of St. Paul's Cathedral to point out that the dome is here and it's, this, it's a different dimension, do you see, than the, than the, than the ceiling. And indeed, here's St. Paul's uh, Cathedral, same idea, Sir Christopher Wren, the, 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 top, the, the, the top of the rotunda inside is a different curvature than the, than the actual dome itself, which I thought was very interesting, and I learned that from my, from my uh, living room at, in, uh, in Washington. Now, here's Robert in the middle of his work. I took that one night, uh, and I was, happened to be there during the restoration of the dome, and the whole, I thought that was, the whole thing was covered with scaffolding and lit up from the inside, and it was an extraordinary uh, uh, view for months and months uh, that was really very uh, striking. And I did once go, the senators and their chiefs of staff, and I suppose members of Congress, are allowed to go up all the way to the top of the dome. I made the mistake of doing that once. The view down <laughs> into the rotunda is one of the most terrifying experiences. <laughs> Uh, I backed away and then went outside and looked out across the mall, which was fine. But there's something about looking down into that, and I, I can't imagine you're having to live with that every day. Um, but uh, it is an extraordinary place. Now, one other story I want to tell. This is the, this is the Statue of Freedom that's on the, on the, the top of the, of the dome, and she looks east. The, the front of the Capitol is the east side that, that faces east, and that's where presidential inaugurations were for, uh, I don't know, 150 years. Uh, there's a famous photograph of Lincoln's second inaugural on the steps on the east front of the Capitol, and on the balustrade behind him in the picture is John Wilkes Booth. And it was about a month before Lincoln's assassination. So John Wilkes Booth was plotting even at that time. He's in that, he's in that famous photograph. But anyway, the east side was designed, and the west side is now, which faces down toward the Lincoln Memorial and the, the uh, Washington Monument, is where inaugurations are now. There's a lot more room and for, for people. But uh, up until, I think, Reagan was the first president who was uh, inaugurated on the west side. Anyway. This statue is really interesting, and it has an interesting bit of history. Uh, you can see that she's wearing a, a helmet with a plume on top. The original design for the statue was that she was going to have a, a cap, a soft cap that would sort of fall over to one side. And the cap was the symbol of the French Revolution. At the time of the French Revolution, it was a, called a freedom cap. Well, it seems that the person in charge of the final construction of the dome was a fellow who had been a senator from Mississippi and was then Buchanan's Secretary of Defense, and his name was Jefferson Davis. Who, by the way, for reasons that still, I think, are a mystery, got an honorary degree from Bowdoin College in 1859. <laughs> I've never been able to ascertain why that was the case. So Davis said, no, we're not going to have the cap because that might be interpreted as an anti-slavery statement, cap of freedom. So that's why today you look at uh, Madam Freedom on top of the uh, dome of the Capitol and she has a helmet. This picture I just took uh, about three nights ago. I was walking home. And you can see down here, there's restoration going on on the House side. This is the Senate side here. The House side is here. And uh, the moon was coming up, and it was just, it was just 
uh, too much. And people said, oh, you're a nice photographer. No, you can take a million pictures with digital until one of them looks good. <laughs> That's that. Um, but it is an inspiring place to work. And uh, it's just, uh, I hope that you will come and visit. Uh, I'll end with this. Any Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock, my office is open for anybody from Maine that's in town uh, for coffee and really good blueberry cake. And we also have young interns, and some of you have told me tonight you've had tours of the Capitol, uh, which is really wonderful. So come and visit. And now I want to introduce Robert Baird. Uh, Robert is a craftsman who started, I love his story, he started working for his father in Williamsburg on restoration at the bottom of a well looking for artifacts. So this guy went from the bottom of a well to the top of the Capitol Dome. Uh, but the, the, and he was in charge, his, his company uh, won the bid to restore the Capitol Dome. It's cast iron. And it, it hadn't been, I don't know how long it had been since it had been maintained, but it really needed work. And uh, it was a long and arduous and wonderfully executed uh, project. And the good news is he lives in Brooklyn, Maine. That's Brooklyn with an I. That's the real Brooklyn. <laughs> so, uh, and we're really honored to have the work that he did in Washington for all of the citizens of America. And we're so happy to have him with us here tonight, Robert Baird. Thank you, Senator King. That was very generous, and it's really a privilege and an honor to be here with you tonight. Um, I want you to know that I love the state of Maine. I was struck by Maine um, when I first came here in the early 80s. Um, I spent a week at Wooden Boat in Brooklyn, and uh, John Wilson was kind enough to let me stay at the boathouse down on the water with my wife and have our pick of any wooden boat that we could uh, climb into. And uh, I bit hook, line, and sinker. And I've dreamt about Maine my entire life. I'm originally from Utah, was raised in Utah. And my father was one of the early uh, preservation architects in America. He was actually mentored by Dr. Ed Kindrew, who was the architect for Williamsburg. My father was chosen to be the architect for the restoration of an early Mormon community on the Mississippi River called Nauvoo. And at the age of 10 years old, my father moved our family from Utah to Illinois, and we lived on the banks of the Mississippi River. And it was there that I got my early education and developed a love for preservation. Um, like Senator King said, um, I did find myself in the bottom of a well and somebody mentioned to me that I ended my career on the top of the dome and uh, I can't think of a better way to end a career in preservation. So today I get to talk about the U.S. Capitol which is one of my favorite subjects. Like Senator King, there's no uh, other place more amazing than to walk into the Capitol. I, for three years, had the opportunity to watch the sunrise and the sunset from the top of the dome. And I wasn't there every single day, but mostly six days a week. And uh, I grew to love the views around Washington, D.C. I want to start my presentation by talking a little bit about cast iron because most people don't know that the dome was actually manufactured in cast iron and I want to give a little bit of context about cast iron and its um, properties. Uh, cast iron is a ferrous metal and um, it weighs 500 pounds a cubic foot. Its melting point is uh, 2060 to 2200 degrees. It has a carbon content of 1.4 to 4 percent and it shrinks an eighth of an inch per foot from its molten state to its solid state. Um, the history of cast iron is, is quite interesting. Of course, the Iron Age started at 2500 years BC, but um, cast iron was actually used as early as 500 AD in architectural structures, and um, they were found in China 
actually monasteries were built up in the mountains and were tied to the mountain by cast iron columns. 1770, uh, 1770, the Iron Bridge over the Severn River was the first major engineered cast iron structure. And um, in Ditherington, in the flax mill, it had a structure made of cast iron. Um, in New York City, there was a, the military in the U.S. built an armory or an arsenal that was made from cast iron in Water Valette. And um, by 1820, cast iron was being used by the British Empire all over the, all over the world. And the commissioner's house in Bermuda was actually, uh, had a cast iron structure. It's interesting that my dad was able to do that restoration. So as a preservationist, in the early 70s, my father uh, was able to restore one of the first cast iron structures in America. There was a complete restoration where the building was disassembled and re-erected. And uh, my brothers and I helped do that restoration in my parents' garage. There was nobody doing that kind of work around. We lived up in the uh, Rocky Mountains and there was a thriving foundry industry still in our community, so we were able to use local foundries and pattern makers uh, to accomplish that work. Um, by the 1850s, cast iron was being widely used around the world. And in Great Britain, which was the largest manufacturer or uh, user of cast iron, was, was uh, uh, using iron in outposts all over the world. In Glasgow, Scotland, the McFarland Foundry, who uh, became world-renowned, was producing a lot of that iron. This is a, an illustration from their 1869 catalog of their showroom. And uh, they made everything from fountains to railing systems to canopies and to glass and iron structures. In the early 1850s, um, about the same time that Thomas U. Walter was uh, chosen to work on the U.S. Capitol, one of the great engineering accomplishments was at the World's Fair, and it was the um, Crystal Palace. It was, it was designed by a gardener who had this idea. They were getting ready to do the, this world exposition, and they couldn't figure out how they were going to build a building big enough. And this gardener came up with an idea using glass and cast iron to build the Crystal Palace. It was 1,850 feet long, 400 feet wide, and 108 feet high. And one of the most amazing structures, and it was all glass and cast iron. So in 1850, a uh, brilliant uh, engineer from New York City was at this exposition. His name was James Bogardus. And he saw what was happening with cast iron. And he came up with this idea to build buildings out of cast iron, cast iron storefronts. And in 1859, he filed a patent with the US Patent Office and became really the founder of cast iron architecture in America. By 1860, foundries were springing up all over the United States to build cast iron facades. And a lot of that was attributed to James Bogardus and his patent. Every major industrial city in America had cast iron structures. So cast iron was starting to become uh, in the forefront of architects and designers. Now, the US Capitol's cast iron dome um, wasn't just created out of thin air. There were precedents for this dome that Thomas U. Walter had seen and was familiar with. One was the um, St. Louis County Courthouse. It was completed, but the dome was actually cast iron. Another one of the structures that Walter was really intrigued with was St. Isaac's Cathedral in St. Petersburg, which had a cast iron dome. So I want to take time now and talk a little bit about the history of the Capitol. Um, the Capitol um, has had a series of architects that have been involved in the design and, the, and managed the work at the U.S. Capitol. The very first 
architect of the Capitol was William Thornton. William Thornton was kind of a Renaissance man. He was born in the British Virgin Islands. He uh, studied in Scotland at the University of Aberdeen and became a doctor. But he loved art and he loved architecture. And he did a grand tour of Europe, saw the architecture in per, uh, Paris and Great Britain and Rome, and self-trained to become an architect. And William Thornton um, heard about this competition to design this new uh, state building in the capital of Washington, D.C., and he created a design, and it was selected to be built. Um, and he became that first architect of the Capitol. Uh, following um, William Thornton, Benjamin Henry Latrobe, uh, who was a neoclassicist, uh, was born and uh, trained in Great Britain, was a, really a classically trained architect. And he, he took Thornton's design and added the central section to the US Capitol and then added a dome to that structure. Um, Henry, uh, Benjamin Henry uh, Latrobe always complained about Thornton because um, he thought he was just cleaning up this amateur's architectural work. Following Latrobe, Charles Bullfinch was the third uh, architect of the Capitol. And he was the very first American-trained classical architect to be involved with the U.S. Capitol. And um, he had gained a reputation for his work in Boston, and he uh, took what was at the U.S. Capitol and added to that, added the front porticos, built a bigger dome, and um, was involved in the U.S. Capitol until 18. Uh, 29. So after, after um, Bullfinch, uh, there was a period of time when there wasn't really an architect of the Capitol. Um, his position had kind of been terminated, and the Capitol was growing, and the building was full, and uh, by 1850, it was determined that the capital needed to be enlarged. And again, there was another competition to select an architect and a design, an enlarged design for the U.S. Capitol. And uh, that competition was entered by several architects. And uh, during that competition, um, no architect was selected. But there was an architect that stood out. And uh, these two men really became the brains behind uh, the master plan and the design of the U.S. Capitol. And they were two real unique individuals. Thomas Hugh Walter is there on the um, left, and uh, Walter Miggs is on the right. Thomas Hugh Walter was classically trained as an architect. Um, he was from Philadelphia. He worked with William Strickland. He helped found the AIA, and he was the architect of the Capitol from 1851 to 1865. Uh, what Walter did that was so unique is um, he hung the drawings that he had created of his master plan for the U.S. Capitol with the House and Senate wings and this enlarged dome, and then he invited senators and congressmen to come into his office to look at those drawings. And everyone that saw them was so impressed that the president actually uh, commissioned him to be the architect of the Capitol. And then um, that uh, building was um, rapidly um, put into construction. And uh, contracts were awarded. I think $100,000 was appropriated to build the building. A lot of the senators and congressmen didn't really know how much it would cost in the end to build. But that money was appropriated, and construction started in 1851. 
of this new uh, Thomas Eustick Walter design. Now the thing that was really interesting is Walter was this brilliant designer, um, but the president appointed um, Miggs from the Corps of Engineers to actually construct the Capitol. And as often occurs in construction projects, when you have a designer and a builder, they butt heads. And it turned out that Walter was, had designed this beautiful building, and Miggs was impeccably honest. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he wanted to make sure that this project ended up in budget, and he was always trying to cut corners on what was designed. And so Walter quit providing him drawings, and then he quit paying Walter. And by 1859, there was a deadlock. Um, the building was in construction, the House and Senate wings were being built, but there was this deadlock. Finally, Walter or, um, Miggs resigned, and Walter took over the construction of the Capitol, and things started to proceed. The thing that's amazing about the U.S. Cap or the, the US Capitol is this cast iron dome and the structure. Uh, as Senator King mentioned, it's an inner dome and an outer dome. And they're tied together by this amazing cast iron structure. So it becomes an amazing engineering feat um, to design and build this, this dome. Much of the design work for the actual dome itself was done by August Schoen, uh, Schoenborn, who was a German engineer that was on the staff of Walter. He created all of the drawings that had Walter's name on them. And I've seen a lot of these drawings. They're magnificent, wash renderings. Uh, these drawings that I show here are five feet wide and nine feet tall, and they're hand rendered with uh, pen and ink and washed with color, and they're phenomenal. So Miggs graduated from West Point. He was the quartermaster general of the U.S. Army. He supervised construction of the U.S. Capitol from 1855 to 1859, and he was also the architect for Arlington Cemetery. So when he left the Capitol, he continued uh, his career as an engineer and become, became one of the cornerstone people that helped during the Civil War and was a right-hand man to uh, Grant. So a couple facts about the dome. The dome is 287 feet tall. It was cast by a foundry in New York City, James uh, Fowler and Kirkland. Uh, there's almost nine million pounds of cast iron involved in the dome and it was purchased for seven cents a pound and that was installed and a lot of it was erected by uh, hired slaves. Uh, the cost for the dome for the construction of the expansion from 1850 to 1866 was a million forty seven thousand dollars and the Statue of Freedom that sits on top that uh, Senator King spoke so nicely about was designed by Thomas Crawford. Interesting to note, Thomas Crawford was a, a brilliant American sculptor who was in Rome. He was commissioned by Walter to develop this model for this statue. And um, he got it completed and then he died of a heart attack. And he was doing the model in Rome. It took from 1858 to 1863 to get the, 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 the model to the United States and then cast in a foundry outside of Washington, D.C. and erected up on the dome. During the course of that design, when Walter finally got the model, the model was three feet taller than was originally planned. So Walter quickly, during that 1859 down period, quickly redesigned the dome to change the proportions so that that statue would fit up there in it three feet taller than it was originally. So I just want to show some images quick of construction. This image uh, shows the U.S. Capitol with the um, enlarged dome 
by uh, Bullfinch. And these images show construction of the cast iron. Um, the way that the cast iron was erected was there was a big steam-powered derrick placed right in the center of the rotunda. The cast iron was brought in, assembled on the ground, and then raised by this derrick. And this is a great picture of Abraham Lincoln standing by this steam-powered derrick. Uh, this image shows one of the cast iron columns. They're about 30 feet tall, being brought in by a team of horses and they were cast in one piece. So that's a column that probably weighs five or 6,000 pounds and is being brought in by a team of horses. These images are magnificent. I love to, I love to look at them closely because when we did work on the building, uh, today we take for granted the tools and equipment that we have at our fingertips realizing that in 1850 there were no power tools. There was no way to drill quickly cast iron. There was no way to quickly cut cast iron. Um, everything had to be done by hand. Um, when the, when the uh, Capitol was designed, there was the Washington Canal came right up the mall and cast iron was brought up the Potomac River and right up to the base of the almost the Capitol, and then brought by teams of horses up onto Capitol Hill. And this image shows that canal. So the dome was assembled, and um, the exterior dome was completed by 1863, and the uh, exterior was completed by 1866. And this shows the dome complete with the Statue of Freedom, which was installed in 1863. So the U.S. Capitol is really a work in progress. Its initial construction started in 1793 to 1826, and then it had its first major restoration in 1851. The East Front renovation took place in 1958 to 1962, and then the West Front Terrace renovations took place in 1993. Uh, the Capitol Visitor Center was built in 2008, there was a first phase for the dome restoration that took place in 2011, and then in 2014, phase two of the dome restoration took place, which was the actual work on the dome itself. Um, in 2015, a, another major project was started that will take uh, seven years, and that's to completely restore all the exterior stone all the way around the U.S. Capitol. And that work is going on now, so you'll see parts of the building that are still in scaffolding. So this is the dome. This shows the apotheosis of George Washington. And you see that beautiful interior structure. This is what the dome looked like when we started restoration. A large donut was placed on the inside to protect uh, the people in the U.S. Capitol because the U.S. Capitol was in full use during the restoration. And this dome caught any debris or any dust that was taking place on the, on the upper interior dome of the Capitol while that restoration was taking place. This illustration shows some of the early renderings that were done <clears throat> by August Schoenborn. And then there are images of that beautiful engineered structure. During the restoration, that interior space between the domes was all cleaned and repainted and it's immaculate. So if you get the opportunity, if you get permission from Senator King's office, you can take a dome tour, but you have to have, you have, to have an escort, and it's magnificent to see. When you walk up into the dome and you walk around the edge of the rotunda and past the windows, there are a series of windows that have engravings that have been made by people's diamond rings from the time the building was built until today. And when we were doing the restoration, I discovered a couple of those windows, and I um, told the preservation people, you really need to make sure that all of that stays in the building. And you can see dates that the people inscribed the glass, but it's, it's a, a magnificent structure to see from the inside. To do the restoration, the dome had to be scaffolded. 
Scaffolding was a major piece of the contract. Um, over 55 miles of pipe scaffolding, if laid from end to end, were, was used to scaffold the building. There were enough scaffolding planks placed on the dome to create a five foot wide sidewalk from the dome to the Lincoln Memorial and back to the Capitol. So it took a year to actually build the scaffolding. So I received a contract to do the work in 2013. I showed up in the field in early 2014 and we waited for the scaffolding to be built so that we could get up to do our work. Now, fortunately for us, the general contractor needed a lot of other things done on the building. So we had work to do that we hadn't planned on. But before we could actually get into the major part of our contract, we, we waited until that scaffolding could be built. And by the end of 2014, the scaffolded, what, scaffolding was topped off, clear up above the Statue of Freedom. This is one of those great images of the U.S. Capitol at night during a storm, uh, all lit up. So why was the dome restored? What were the problems that were so great that it needed to be um, repaired? There were corroded and broken castings, random fractures in the iron, broken and missing fasteners, rust jacking. There was a lot of issues with dissimilar metals where you have iron and cast iron together and the one material is more noble than the other so one dissolves faster. The cast iron was more noble than the wrought iron and the building was fastened with wrought iron fasteners and those fasteners disintegrated. These are images of <clears throat> what we found when we got on the job site. Um, these are some great big acorn finials. They weigh about 350 pounds a piece. There was not one thing holding those on the dome except their weight. <clears throat> we actually picked those off when we got up there. Um, these are a lot of the cracks. And what happened was there was a major gutter system that was built internal in the dome. And over the years, the cast iron expanded and contracted. It had been waterproofed with caulks that were made out of linseed oil and oakum and chalk. And that got brittle, kind of turned into stone, but through the freeze thaw and the expansion and contraction, the caulking fell out and the moisture got into the inside of the dome. And once the water got in, it started to work on all of the fastenings. And that freeze thaw created this brittle iron to go through movement, which caused it to break. These are ornaments that are on the capitals. And we literally could pick them off like picking apples when we were up on the, on the dome. This is another area where moisture had gotten in behind parts. And as, rust, as uh, cast iron deteriorates, it creates a, a condition called rust jacking. The metal begins to expand, and it actually blows itself apart. So as moisture would get in behind parts, as the fasteners would deteriorate, and as the rust grew, it literally was tearing itself apart. And this is an example of some of that iron that we took off the building. Uh, other parts were full of debris and rust. These are fasteners that we pulled out that you can see the electrolysis where all of the threads and the fasteners disintegrated and in some cases we could just pull the fasteners right out of the building. So there were a series of repair methods that were developed to take care of the capital. Now as one of America's greatest treasures it's treated like a museum artifact. As we started the restoration uh, just when we were really ready to go we discovered that in the 1960s when they'd done repairs on the dome, they had caulked all of those repairs with asbestos caulk. And 14 miles of asbestos caulk had to be removed uh, from the dome. There was a repair method. You can't weld cast iron with any longevity. And a repair method was discovered that was developed in Germany to repair um, engines in great big ships and it's called lock and stitch. And basically, 
it's a mechanical fastening method where you, you take a crack, it's drilled, and then fasteners are put in and they're ground off flush, and then there's a vertical dog bone stitch that is mortised into the iron and driven in and ground smooth. You'll see some of that as we go through. Then there's the lead abatement. So the dome was um, cast iron, but it was painted with lead paints. So the entire dome had to be completely sand blasted and all of the lead abated so that the um, repair work could be done. And all of that had to be done without affecting any of the general public. So think of this, the building is in operation. You have one of the biggest lead abatement projects going on at the same time. So to do that lead abatement, the scaffolding was enclosed in containments and then those areas were sandblasted. The repairs took place in the containments and we worked our way around the building. The dome can be divided into 30, 32 pie sections. And one of the amazing things about cast iron is it was, um, everything can be manufactured and built sort of like an erector set. There's just a kit of parts. So if you have a column capital, um, it has a kit of parts and all of those parts are identical on all 32 columns. Now, it's interesting to note that the column capitals we discovered when we took them apart are comprised of over 300 castings for each capital. This shows the lock and stitch method. You can see a string of threaded pins that have been put along a crack and they're being ground smooth. This image shows uh, a repair that was done with lock and stitch. You can see the threaded, the threaded inserts and then the dog bones that cross that. And then it's all ground smooth and then painted. And those repairs are stronger than the original cast iron. In this job, there were over 14,000 inches of lock and stitch that had to be installed. It takes two mechanics an hour to do one inch. So you get an idea of how many people and how much time was involved in that effort. This shows mechanics doing that lock and stitch repair. The other repairs that were done on the job, uh, you can't weld cast iron like I said, but you can braze it. And uh, a series of repairs were done on small ornaments that could be removed and brazed and assembled uh, versus uh, recasting those parts. Um, then there were a whole series of mechanical repairs. When the column capitals had to be uh, restored, they were originally uh, assembled and set on the columns and then the dome was built around them and all the fasteners were on the inside of these capitals with no way to access them. So we had to develop a method to remove the fasteners and then reinstall the parts fastening from the other side. And uh, that was taken care of. And then there were a whole series of repairs where there were holes and things that needed to be filled and those were all done with uh, epoxy repairs. Uh, replicating uh, missing castings and, and broken cast iron. It's a really fascinating process starts with field documentation. So I was really fortunate in this restoration to have a, a young team of craftsmen. On, on my particular team, I had 11, 11 young guys on my crew. Uh, two were classically trained architects. I had a couple of metal workers, a sculptor, and then some uh, skilled metal workers. But First, you have to document what you have to make. And these are field notes from just one of our, our workbooks when we were looking at what parts needed to be manufactured. So we had the use of modern technology and we could uh, digitally scan components. Um, we could take them off the building, scan them with the scanner, and then create a 3D model. And um, from that 3D model, we could design and make patterns uh, 
and interpret those in shop drawings. And a lot of the parts, there were just fragments of them on the building when we took the components off the building. We didn't know what they were originally, but we had to re-engineer and redesign them so that they would work in their locations. We also used uh, an ancient method of making models by making plaster molds. And we would take a component off the building and create a plaster mold of it. If we didn't have our digital scanner, then we could send those molds out to the foundry and they could use those molds to create patterns to replicate parts. Foundry patterns are made of wood, rubber, or plastic. And uh, what I said earlier in the presentation that cast iron shrinks an eighth of an inch per foot, as we were manufacturing parts that had to go back on the dome that had to fit exactly, we had to figure out a way to make those parts uh, fit by creating a pattern that was larger than the part actually needed to be so that when it was cast it would shrink to the right size. And uh, we developed, we devised a really ingenious way, one of our pattern makers, we'd create a rubber mold and then from that rubber mold we would figure out a series of pins and we could stretch that mold to get it to the right size it needed to be to make a pattern and then we'd use that pattern to actually cast the part that would shrink back to the, to the right size. These are images of, of those patterns. The foundry process is uh, about the same as it was during the time that the U.S. Capitol was built. Essentially there's a pattern that is uh, put together, it could be wood or plastic, and uh, those patterns are molded in sand, and then molten metal is poured into that sand mold, and the sand mold is broken and the castings are taken out of the sand, and then they're cleaned up. One of the great things about cast iron is it's very um, moldable. Uh, when it's molten and it's poured into a mold, it will create really good details. And we could capture all the detail in the capital. One of the things that we devised along the way, we were taking all this material off the dome that seemed like it was junk, and we uh, were able to take that cast iron and melt it down and re-alloy it and use it in the new castings. So a really a true green material, we could actually use the metal that came from the building in the new parts that were going back up on the dome. During the, the restoration, probably the two major areas that had the most work that needed to be done, up at the Tholos level, up below the Statue of Freedom, that balustrade had to be completely removed. It was in a serious state of disrepair and it was disassembled and carried down the dome. So we had 287 feet of scaffolding and we had all this metal at the very top of the dome. It had to be carried uh, by hand. We had three lifts, and, uh, but it had to be carried and lowered to the ground. And, and then it was crated up and shipped to our plant in Utah where we were able to re- uh, lay out that Tholos balustrade, take all the parts that we could use, manufacture all the new parts, and then it was taken back and reinstalled, carried up the building, and reinstalled back on the dome and uh, to complete that part of the work. One of the things that we discovered during this part of the restoration was we had assumed that the dome was perfectly round. And when we... <laughs> When we took the Tholos balustrade off, of course, we took all of these accurate measurements, but you couldn't measure through the center spiral staircase in the center of the top of the Tholos. And uh, the dome is actually elliptical up there. It's not round. <laughs> so when we laid this out in our shop, of course, we lay it out in a perfect circle, and then we bring it back and we start installing it, and parts don't fit. And we ended up having to cut and fit every single part on that Tholos and, um, to, to make it fit and go back together again. There were many, all of the, the dome is highly ornate. You would you'd never imagine, and the scale of the ornament on the dome is 
you know, incredible. You have to stand next to it to really appreciate it. But all of the ornament, applied ornament, came off of the dome, was disassembled, cleaned, reassembled, and refastened, and then reinstalled on the dome. We discovered the column capitals and the, um, the serious deterioration that was there. After the lead abatement, we were able to go in and explore, take column capitals apart, and then take pieces. This is, this is one corner scroll. There are four of these on every column capital, and each scroll is made up of over 20 parts but completely come apart, have to be reassembled, and then reinstalled. This shows uh, new parts getting ready to go up on the dome, and this is the reassembly of those column capitals, and that's a completed capital. So you never would imagine the level of detail until you're up close. The thing that I was uh, amazed by was how close the actual cast iron is to the original uh, Thomas E. Walter drawings, and on the interior of the dome and on the exterior of the dome. Uh, we could actually refer to his original drawings, and uh, they're, they're very, very close. The boilerplate balustrade was another major area that was a problem uh, at the Capitol, and that was because that's where all these gutters came together, and they had all deteriorated. We ended up taking 54 gutters out of the the balustrade, and then uh, reinstalling, casting new gutters, and reinstalling them, and then reinstalling that whole balustrade on the U.S. Capitol. So these new gutters will ensure another easel, easily 150, 200 years of life to the dome. All of the water was redirected into the gutters, and they were improved so that those problems that, that had occurred up until then will, will not happen again. After the dome was uh, sandblasted, it had to be painted, and um, there was a crew of over 100 painters that worked for a year um, painting the dome, building up the paints to the appropriate thicknesses. People don't understand that cast iron is somewhat uh, porous, and the castings, after they've been sandblasted, all of the porosity is exposed, so you have cavities in the cast iron. If moisture gets in those, they weep rust. So uh, the cast iron had been sandblasted, but then it had to be prime painted and then coated with epoxy, all of those holes filled, and then recoated, and uh, to ensure that there, there won't be any rust staining to take place on the dome in the future. This shows images of the guys doing the painting and the caulking and the waterproofing. There are um, 32 big glass windows that were handmade around the dome. Five of those had to be replaced. That glass was remanufactured uh, out in a glass factory, just like it was made um, when the building was originally built and that glass was reinstalled. This is our crew. Um, our responsibility was specifically to disassemble and reassemble the dome and provide all of the new cast iron ornament. And there were several other people involved in the, in, in the project. Um, when, the, when the dome was complete, we came to the point when we were putting the last piece of ornament on the building. And Stephen Ayers, the architect of the Capitol, came and actually installed that last piece of ornament. But the Capitol Dome restoration was really an incredible collaboration of artists and craftsmen. It wasn't any one person or even uh, the general contractor. It, it was a collaboration of everybody. Artists, glass specialists, decorative painters, um, pattern makers, mechanics, electricians, plumbers. And it's, it's that kind of united brotherhood that I fell in love with. Um, I, I am a firm believer that, um, that there is a red thread that ties us all together. And uh, the things that happened on this project to make it a success where people came in exactly at the right time to do their specific piece of the job 
Um, it was really kind of miraculous to see it happen. There was a tremendous spirit of brotherhood of the, the craftsmen. Now, um, a lot of the employees that were working on the exterior of the dome were from different nationalities. And um, there were lots of Latinos. All of the asbestos that was removed from the building was removed by a team of Latino women. And they were amazing. And we would have lunches on Friday, and they'd bring their food, and we'd bring our food. And it was, it was just a wonderful collaboration. There was a tremendous spirit there. Um, I think the job that was done by everybody who was involved in the project in the end far exceeded, I think, what the government really expected because everybody knew that they were working on something extremely special. Um, I know that uh, in, in our case, there were lots of things that were done that we did just to make sure that there would not be problems down the road, and I know that was the case with a lot of the other people involved in the project. The project was completed in 2016, and uh, it was completed um, just in time for the inauguration to take place. So these are images. If you, if you could have seen the dome, well, you saw pictures of the dome up close. When it was completed, uh, these images are, you know, really amazing. And uh, it was a wonderful project to work on. So a lot of the images that you'll see, if you go to the AOC's website and you're looking at the dome, they were all images that were captured by this gentleman. His name's Charles Badal, and he shot and saved over 25,000 images of the restoration and documented that whole thing for the U.S. Uh, Capitol and for the architect of the Capitol. An, an incredible guy. So I just want to take another second and just talk about some of the fun stuff that happened there. And on the, on the dome, during the restoration, um, there is a tremendous amount of wildlife in Washington, D.C. You would, you would never imagine what we uh, came across while we were working on the project. We had bald eagles fly over. We had eagles that were regularly on the dome. There were red foxes. Um, and um, this little guy... Uh, found his way up to the Statue of Freedom. <laughs> and uh, the, painters, the painters went up in the morning, and there was this raccoon that was just cornered at the top of the scaffold. He couldn't go anywhere. And uh, somebody went and got one of these safe traps, and they uh, got him in it, and then they took him over to the National Arboretum and let him go. But... Uh, you would never imagine, too, that at 280 feet in the air, there's as many bugs as there are. I mean, flies and insects, and they are just everywhere. It's, I don't know if they're, you know, blowing in the trade wind or what, but it's, you know, it, it was an amazing experience. Um, I just uh, want to say thanks for letting me have the opportunity to come and visit with you about this project. And we've got time for a couple of questions. If, if there's four questions, somebody has a question they want answered, we'll, we'll take just a couple. Yes? I've got a couple of questions. These one on the hard one, and I'm not sure which is which. At the beginning, you mentioned that the fasteners were the similar metals. Was that a, was that a, what, in the original one? Okay, so the fasteners were dissimilar from the cast iron. Was that, was that a problem? Budget or what? No, no, it wasn't. Cast iron, okay, cast iron is extremely brittle, but it was fastened with iron fasteners that were hand forged. And uh, I actually. Did they not know that this I don't think they understood at that time that there was going to be an issue with the dissimilar metals. Okay, my other question is if you have a kit with the entire. If you had the kit of all the parts that were required to make the dome, how many, how many parts would make one? 
full set of parts? How many parts, unique parts are there? There are, there are new, unique parts. There are probably, thou, probably thousands unique parts. Um, I just want to finish that by saying when the restoration was done, all of the fasteners were changed to stainless steel, which will have no reaction to the cast iron. So that will never be a problem again. Yes? What was the total budget for doing the restoration, and how is that prepared? What we need to do with this building? Well, I, I have no idea. I have no idea in comparison to this building. I think the budget, the budget for the U.S. Capitol, and I don't know that anybody will ever really know the exact amount that was spent. I mean, it was roughly around $130 million, but it started at about $80 million uh, to do the exterior, but then when they started working on the exterior, they decided to do the interior cast iron dome at the same time, which uh, was done, which was really needed to all be done at the same time. So, and a lot of things were addressed so that that will never have to happen again. Um, but in comparison to what it's going to take to do this building, I don't, I don't have a clue. But it's worth saving. The next um, threat to the Capitol building is the well, I don't, you know, it's, the thing that is amazing is the House and Senate, that's their offices. It's Senator King's office. And that building is such a significant symbol of freedom that it's extremely well cared for. Now, I've worked on hundreds of buildings in my career across the country. And there are none that have the preventative maintenance that is like the U.S. Capitol. In fact, it'd be really a blessing if a lot of the buildings I'd worked on had had that kind of care. The Capitol was in a serious state of disrepair, but it was also cared for. So that may, you know, makes a huge difference. Yes? What kind of call, what kind of paint did you use? So um, this will be the last question, and then I'll hang around after I can answer some questions. But the paint, was a uh, uh, epoxy polyurethane uh, system, and the caulks were uh, polysulfide caulks. NP1 was the primary paint system that could, basically it's a caulk that can be painted, and uh, it, was, it was used in the project. I, I have to say, as an architect, I, I'm totally in awe of the story that Robert told. It is just truly amazing. All I can say is, wow, that's just, that's incredible. Uh, and as president of this organization, by the way, my name is Paul Stevens, uh, I can't think of a lecture that we could have had that speaks so much to the mission uh, of this organization, which is to support and has been the mission of our organization for 200 years, which is to support artists, craftsmen, and tradesmen in our community. And I think we just saw a tremendous example uh, of what uh, trained craftsmen and tradesmen can do. In addition to thanking, thanking Robert, uh, who I think just wandered in here by accident, which is how this lecture got, got scheduled, uh, thank Robert and, and thank Senator King for coming and presenting this tonight. Uh, I follow Senator King on Instagram, as all of you should do. Uh, <laughs> and it's fun, it's great fun to do. And as Chandra will attest to, he actually responds to you sometimes uh, when you make a comment, which is wonder wonderful to have uh, a senator that can, can exchange ideas like that uh, with us. Uh, I think in closing, I would like to, to thank all of our patrons and sponsors. Uh, we, as an organization, raised an enormous amount of money uh, with this event tonight. And thank you to everybody that helped make that happen, to the committee uh, and, and to our sponsors. And I think I want to uh, give a special thanks and, and sort of recognition uh, to, to one of our major sponsors, which is Turner Construction. Uh, and Turner Construction was the general contractor uh, for this project. And as many of you may know, Turner is currently doing the very large uh, 
uh, addition and renovation uh, to Maine Medical Center here in town. So I, I think at the end, if you have time, uh, well, you certainly can, are welcome to come up and, and ask uh, some more questions. Uh, but please stop in the exhibit downstairs on the way out. Uh, many of the photographs that, that Robert referred to are, are on display, uh, as, well as, as well as copies of some of those wonderful uh, Thomas Walter architectural drawings. And actually, there are some samples of the cast iron work that, uh, that, that Robert's company did. And, and pick some of that up and, and feel how heavy it is. It's kind of, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> it really is. Um, and I think I definitely want to thank uh, Bruce Brown and Robert who curated the exhibit for us. And that exhibit opened last first Friday and it will be open until the first of next month. So thank you all for coming and thank you all for your support. And I hope that you will continue to come to events here. Thank you.